This semester, we've experienced the Great War from many different perspectives. We've read texts from the English and the German points of view, considered different experiences of women and men, thought about gung-ho war supporters and conscientious objectors, even considered the war from the point of view of persons living in 1914 to 1918 versus that of people living in the late 20th and early 21st centuries. This week, our texts are about remembrance, which is a good place to stop as we look back over the semester in preparation for the exam. Remembering the Great War is always going to be culturally fraught. It looks different for Germans versus English people and different for Europeans versus Americans. Even the way we remember the war, it is still a central, vitally important conflict for Europeans who see it as the first act of a war that ended in 1945 while most Americans learn almost nothing about it in school, reveals the important cultural differences that would go on to govern how the combatant nations conceived of war itself, as well as their national characters. As we examine the poems of remembrance, compare them to the war poetry we've read so far. The Great War created problems for poets and writers in that the forms that had come down to them seemed ill-fitted for the war. Traditional texts about war could be elegiac. They could certainly focus on loss and even on the pointlessness of individual loss. But typically, they didn't question the war itself, even if they suggested that war is hell. In the First World War, many, many texts did question the war itself. How should a writer memorialize lost comrades when he or she believes their loss resulted from deliberate deception, unconscionable blundering, or grotesque hunger for power? Our first book this semester began with Siegfried Sassoon's words of protest against the war. He protested knowing that he was not privy to government secrets on either side, but believing, based on his experience as a soldier, that his government was changing the, the predicate for the war in ways that made it a negotiated peace impossible. He protested as a soldier, but also as a citizen, calling out his government for malfeasance. Contrast that to the propaganda all governments offered their citizens. Questioning the conduct of the war or the reasons it was being fought should have been unthinkable to any citizen at the time. And of course, the British government strove to make these questions unthinkable by sending Sassoon for psychiatric treatment at Craig Lockhart rather than court-martialing him. Soldiers, who obviously are on the literal front lines of conflicts, are often the first to observe when military efforts are failing or ill-conceived, and thus governments have strong reasons for wanting to, to suppress the actual voices of soldiers in favor of more jingoistic representations, such as presentations at sporting events, bumper stickers, and other modes of supporting the troops that don't involve actually listening to their experiences. Arguably, this preference by governments has something to do with inadequate treatments for PTSD, both during the Great War and even now. As we know from regeneration and from contemporary texts, including Rivers' medical lecture and the 1922 Shell Shock Commission in London, acknowledging the extent and prevalence of psychological injury to troops is a way of beginning to understand the full cost of a war, and governments engaged in wars never want their people to see the full cost of the war they are fighting, particularly when the rationale for the war is sketchy or the prospects of victory seem slim. In this context, then, the writers of the First World War sought to write poetry and prose that invoked true soldiers' voices. They wanted to capture the suffering of those on the front and those at home and in medical facilities who witnessed soldiers with suffering and who themselves suffered the loss of loved ones and the agony of not knowing their loved ones' fates. They did not want to paper over this suffering with images of glory, such as those we saw in the Charge of the Light Brigade. They sought particular voices that could convey the nobility of the ordinary people who suffered and died, without saying they were noble because they died in a good cause. If you remember Rupert Brooke's poem, The Soldier, from the very beginning of the course, Brooke believed that his imagined death would be noble because he would make a little patch of foreign soil into England. By contrast, Wilfred Owen would write about these who die as cattle. Once the war was over, though, the combatant nations needed to memorialize the event, to remember the dead, and to try to put into narrative the experience they had lived through. 
nations had various ways to do this. Germany, which ended the war defeated and humiliated by the Treaty of Paris, erected monuments like Katie Colvis's The Grieving Parents at Bladso Cemetery in Belgium. The, the British erected the Cenotaph in Whitehall, originally a temporary structure in wood that was so popular it was remade in Portland stone. The Allies also erected the Meningate Memorial in Ypres, a location that continues to be the for focus of war remembrances each day when the last post is played at sundown. The Menengate Memorial is inscribed with the names of soldiers lost in the war, whose bodies were never recovered. The architect thought there was ample room for the names of all the lost soldiers from battles around Ypres, but after memorializing 54,896 soldiers, the memorial was out of space, and the remaining British soldiers' names are inscribed in time Tyne Cot Cemetery, while soldiers from British colonies have a completely separate memorial. Colvis's memorial focuses on loss. The parents are bowed down by grief, representing the feelings of survivors of the war who feel neither joy nor relief, but only sadness and loss. The Menin Gate, by contrast, is designed as a triumphal arch, albeit one that opens into an area memorializing the dead. The soldiers named here occupy a different space than, say, the soldiers memorialized on the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, that great black wall listing the names of 57,000 people who died in the Vietnam War. For the most part, the bodies of those soldiers were recovered and returned to the United States for, bur for burial. But the Menin Gate is specifically dedicated to soldiers whose remains were never found or identified. And remember, there were so many at just this one location that the memorial proved too small to contain all the names. No wonder Siegfried Sassoon saw the irony inherent in this monument, a triumphal arch that cannot erase the indignity done to the men it memorializes. Bitterly ironic, Sassoon calls it a sepulcher of crime. For him, the mismatch between the triumphal grandeur of the monument and the ignominious, horrific deaths of the soldiers is too much to bear. Kipling's poems also reflect the profound disillusionment of one who has suffered because of the war. Kipling had been a big fan of the war. He is generally known for his somewhat thoughtless jingoistic patriotism, and he had pulled strings so that his underage son Jack could join the Flying Corps early and head to France while still too young to be in the army at all, let alone in combat. Jack was killed early on, hence Kipling's recognition in the epitaphs that one of the costs of the war is mother's suffering and one of the causes is father's lies. His personal guilt over his son's death, his new understanding of the power of images to induce young men to crave honor and glory from combat, and the grief through which he now views the world, combine to transform this eminently Victorian writer into something more like a heavenly, ironized modernist one. This urge to match memorializing with conventional expression is strong, though. In Flanders Fields, written by a Canadian doctor after a ca heavy casualty battle, begins with the elegiac mode we associate with Great War Memorial poetry. The image of the red poppies blooming among the white crosses powerfully evokes loss and is perhaps responsible for our continued use on both sides of the Atlantic of the poppy as a symbol of remembrance for war dead. You can probably get one from the VFW at your lo local grocery store on November 11th each year. But look what the poem does in the last stanza. It leaves elegy behind and makes claims about what the dead want as a suitable memorial from the living, and it is to take up our quarrel with the foe. The tone of the last stanza differs completely from the two stanzas of the four, so much so that there is no suggestion in the early stanzas that the poem is going to become a plea to continue the battle. How different from the poems of Sassoon or Owen, or even Rosenberg, who uses similar imagery but stays in the elegiac tone instead of shifting to the more conventional language of McRae's last stanza. What do you make of Lawrence Binion's poem? This poem is widely used in British remembrance exhibits and activities, particularly the stanza beginning, We Shall Not Grow Old. Would you say this poem deploys conventions of memorial poetry that existed before the Great War? Does it use them but alter them? How would you say it relates to poems like, in parenthesis? I don't want to leave the topic of memorializing the war without thinking about the soldier's song, When This Bloody War Is Over. 
This song imagines that one day the war will be in the past, though it is not at the time the song is set. As is typical of soldier songs about army life, the speaker in the song is not crazy about the many regulations and petty torments of the army, such as having to get a pass in order to do anything, and being generally subject to the whims of higher-ups who have a great deal of power over one's day-to-day -day quality of life without necessarily having the personal characteristics that should qualify one to have that sort of power. This song doesn't talk about honor and glory, or about anything very big, actually. The person who originally came up with these words and matched them to the evangelical hymn tune is in the middle of one of the most brutal wars ever fought, but church parade comes in for a great deal more opprobrium than trench life. Why do you suppose that is? Perhaps it is an example of what Stephen Kern calls the eternal present, the self-preserving attitude of trench soldiers to focus on what's right in front of their faces rather than pulling back to see the big picture. For most of them, the big picture would only be too depressing. They had no influence on whether the war would continue or stop, no power to alter the suicidal battle plans of their generals. In that context, dreaming of a trip to town that doesn't involve supplication for a pass might be less escapist and more empowering. This song is more like the soldier's poetry we've read and less like the high-sounding notes of the Charge of the Light Brigade, or even the last stanza of In Flanders Fields. And that might suggest something to us about how the soldiers of the Great War want to be remembered, as people who suffered and fought as cheerily as could be, finding pleasure where they could, and enduring the hardships imposed upon them. They don't seem to ask us to honor them because their cause was noble or just. Whether on the losing or the winning side, the suffering and loss were the same. They ask us to hear their stories in their reality and complexity without imposing conventional beliefs about warfare and soldiering. They don't want thank you for your ser service, followed by turning away. They want us to listen to them and to see them.